We are in Champions League, man. That was my dilly next question. Dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham and so Sharon won it. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Christopher Malinab. He is the assistant coach at Reno 1868, the pro team that competes in the USL over here in the US. But we're taking this conversation in a different direction that we have with most of our other podcasts, completely away from the pitch and on to mental health which is an area that Christopher is a huge advocate for. So he's going to share his personal, powerful, inspiring story, as well as giving the coaching community some advice and a little education in how to deal with it in our teams and in our colleagues in the coaching community. So it's an amazing insight and it's something that I think the game as a whole, we can all do a better job of understanding a little bit more. So as always, appreciate your thoughts at Gary Kernin on Instagram, at Gary Kernin on Twitter. This podcast is brought to you by the Modern Soccer Coach Community Platform, online resource with daily content, over 250 video exercises, tactical analysis pieces, dialogue alongside coaches, and we've also added a new monthly webinar feature, which begins this Monday, September 23rd, where I'm going to spend an hour looking at defensive transitioning, a lot of video to go over, a lot of work from Coach Paint as well that we've worked alongside. All the webinars are free for all the members. It's only $6 a month. You get tons of content. So you can go check it out or you can go to modernsoccercoach.com slash shop and you can get an annual pass along with a Modern Soccer Coach book of your choice for only $60. So... Thanks for checking that out. Thanks for listening and supporting Modern Soccer Coach community, supporting the podcast. Here is Christopher. Enjoy. Christopher, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Really excited to have you on. Yeah, thanks, Gary, for having me on. Excited to, to be on this episode. It's an interesting one. It's something that I just said to you off, off air there, something that I've always wanted to do and not very confident in what way to move it. So we'll see where this goes. But I wanted to, to almost give you a platform to kick it off and you contacted me about two months ago uh, with a really exciting project on this, your collaboration with the brand new day clothing, the t-shirt campaign. Do you just want to kick it off with, with sharing your story behind everything and we'll go from there? Yeah. So uh, I, I guess we'll, we'll start off with the collaboration itself. It was a, uh, it was a partnership or collaboration with brand new day clothing uh, where their sales actually go to benefit a group called hope squads, which brings suicide, education prevention, peer-to-peer um, programs to elementary schools. And so with that being said, this last off season, I had a very, um, I probably hit one of my darkest moments with a suicide attempt myself. I've been living with bipolar disorder for about 13 years since I was diagnosed. Um, and it kind of just hit me. And it wasn't anything that I say was, was scripted. Um, to be honest, a lot of it became where I was autopilot, where I was almost unconsciously making decisions that I didn't know. Um, detachment, um, hitting depression, some forms of mania that weren't necessarily things that I said, okay, look, I'm hitting in a bad, bad direction. I'm starting to get into this dark rabbit hole um, per se. And so I was fortunate enough to, to wake up the day after my, my suicide attempt and someone or something I guess was in the universe was saying, it's not your time to go. And slowly but surely I started to begin my recovery process with the professionals who I've been working with, a therapist and psychiatrist, uh, balancing out my medications um, and seeing my therapist weekly along with my family and, and close support group around, around me to, to make sure that, that I don't hit those holes again. Or if I do that, you know, someone is saying, Hey, you're not, looking right. You're not acting right. You seem detached. Let's tackle this together. Um, throughout the whole time, I thought, even with my family, I thought I was alone in this battle. Um, in fact, I was pretty, pretty much, uh, embarrassed, um, to 
to even talk about it. I, a lot of my closest friends and family had no idea that I was dealing with bipolar disorder, dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety, um, and those types of things on a day to day basis. In fact, even taking medication. Um, I remember some of the times I would go to see therapy, um, while I was in Sacramento is that I would actually park my car, look around and make sure that no one I knew would see me get out of my car and go into the therapist's office. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where I was. And so you can probably imagine that, uh, living a life like that can, can take its toll, um, where, where you're, where you're embarrassed about something that you have no choice of, of living with. Um, you know, it is an, an illness. It is a mental health challenge. And so, um, I wasn't necessarily ready to accept that. Um, so then moving forward after my attempt, I, like I said, I, I spent some time in the hospital and, um, and there that's, that's where I, I was put in a safe environment and then continue to, to move forward with my life, um, and make sure I was, I was keeping myself in an environment, safe environment and I still do. Um, so during that time I was kind of researching some things just online and about educating myself so I can help educate the people around me because that's probably the biggest challenge in living with bipolar disorder or any other mental illness or, or mental health challenges that the people around you, they want to help. They just don't know because they don't understand what it's like to, to live with it uh, firsthand or they, they're afraid of saying the wrong thing or they're afraid of doing the wrong thing. And so, um, so I actually stumbled across a brand new day um, as I was kind of just searching for, for things and I saw who they, who their sales uh, went to benefit and it went to early elementary school. And I thought, you know, let me look a little bit more into the, the demographics of why is it so important to have these programs available to kids and come to find out that no more, the one of the top um, causes of, of death of kids ages 10 to 14 is suicide. And so when I saw this, I said, you know what? Mental health uh, month, May is, is coming around. Um, semicolon day is on April 16th. And, and that's when we actually announced the, the partnership or the collaboration with this t-shirt, um, which is a, a semicolon. And I thought I would want to kind of promote that towards the soccer side. And so the top part of the semicolon is a soccer ball. Um, and around it, it says a brand new day, you know, so um, tomorrow's a brand new day. Sorry. But that's, that's kind of where it went. And our goal was to hit 100 t-shirts. If we can get hundred t-shirts out into the country, uh, we thought we we would make an impact because then people would ask, oh, what is that shirt? And um, and then people could say, oh, you know, there's there, there's someone that I know or someone who um, I came across on social media that is struggling with it. And it's not so much about me. It's so much about, OK, let's start conversation. And I happen to be part of that conversation. And um, the more and more that we started to, um, you know, kind of promote this T-shirt, the more I realized that there's a lot of people struggling with with the challenges and they just didn't know how to how to really address it because they were afraid of they were ashamed of, of living with it. And also they found the same challenges as I did is that people around me maybe didn't know. It's not that they didn't care because the people around us absolutely love us and they absolutely care. It's one of those things that because there is such a stigma around mental health and, and mental illness. Um, the resources aren't so readily available unless you actually dive deep into some of these organizations that do promote it. And so, um, so through the t-shirts, it, it's actually opened up conversation and, and really helped me through my, through my path and, and journey to recovery and knowing that, Hey, it, not every day is going to be perfect. Um, and in fact, coming to the realization and accepting that if I stop going to therapy, stop seeing my psychiatrist, stop taking my meds, that I could end up where I was in, in this last off season in December and January. And so it's a constant reminder that, Hey, I'm fighting a good fight, not just for myself, but we as a community, as a society, as a culture, we're, we're all fighting a good fight. And we've got to make sure that we take the steps to continue to, to educate those around us. And, and maybe some people aren't ready to talk about it, but if people can, if the individual that's, that's fighting a, an illness can say, you know what, I need to go see a therapist and it's okay to see a therapist. Maybe I talk about it openly with, you know, all of my, all, all the people on social media, but maybe my, I can open up to my best friend or, you know, my, my parents about it. Then, then I think we're heading in the right step because one by one we're educating uh, the people around us. Yeah. That education 
piece and that awareness piece, as I learn more about it, they're becoming more and more critical. I listened to one of your interviews with the, with the Reno fan group when they were saying about, because you hear about good days and bad days, that people's recovery is not just a click of a finger and they're, 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 everything's great. But I was wondering, you said in that, in, in that interview that your every step forward is a success, even if it's just a centimeter every day. What does that small gain look like for you? What does it feel like? Um, honestly, waking up, waking up. And I think sometimes we take for granted um, some of the small things. You know, I, I was able to talk to my best friend on the phone. I was able to send a text message. Um, you know, really finding the small little things that, that I think we take for granted. Um, there's, a, there's a saying out there, make it to midnight, uh, meaning that, hey, if you have a bad day, you make it to midnight you've started a new day. You've already crossed that path of an opportunity to have a new day. So, you know, and you think those, those, those small things, you know, especially with, with, with soccer, it's something I love to do every, every single day. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm given this opportunity to, to make a difference on the field, whether it's as myself to, to better myself, but let's pull back even from there, you know, take away working with players. Every day I get to put my cleats on, you know, the moment I get to tie my cleats on, I, <laughs> I get to do something I love, you know, good, bad, or, you know, win, loss, or draw. I get to do something I love. All right. Maybe today's just even putting my cleats on, maybe getting to lace them up. And, and that's a small victory, you know, and, and so that could be the centimeter in, the, in a positive direction. Something that I hear quite often with people who struggle with it is that, you know, nobody knew at the time. And you, and you said that your friends didn't even know you were struggling. So if we, if we kind of scale back to the coaching community, and you said it, this, we all want to help each other. We all want to help our players, but sometimes we don't know what people are struggling with. What are some signs that coaches can look for, either in colleagues or in players, and then what can we do to help them? You know, I think, um, let me start off by saying, obviously, having gone through this, I'm not a professional um, in, in this field, but, you know, just I think from my personal experiences, um, you know, because the, there, there is no single face of, of mental illness, no single um, characteristic, right? There's, there's an entire spectrum of it. And so I, I think kind of looking at my experience specifically, um, after everything was, was done as far as my suicide attempt and, and slowly recovering over those la first few weeks, over the la last you know, few months and, and so forth, um, I look back on it and my friends look back on it. My family looks back on it as far as um, they see the signs of the attachment. My outgoing, happy personality wasn't the same. Um, I didn't, internally, I didn't find the joys that I did of the things that normally bring me joy. Even going out to, to go on a run, I found it as a chore. Um, so I think as far as like people around us, I think noticing that, hey, this person doesn't seem to like the same person that I know. Um, I think is is a telltale sign of maybe it's not a, maybe it's not necessarily a, to the extreme of, of where I went as far as a suicide attempt, but it could be like hey something's going on let, let let's find out you know and, and don't let it go just to hey how are you doing oh I'm fine don't just leave it at that go hey you know what over the last week or last you know couple weeks you haven't been as cheerful as you normally are or you seem like you don't want to talk to us and or talk to me type of thing and and just just making sure that that person is really okay you know and i think in a fast-paced society that we live in we're so quick to already think that the person's going to say oh i'm fine and we move on um but really taking the time to go hey you know let's do you have a break in the day let's go grab some coffee let's let's talk about life you know let's let's talk about the good things uh, or maybe the struggles that you have um rather than just saying Oh, how's it going? And and then moving on. I, I think um, I think really, really taking the time and showing that you care um, to to find out if something is wrong. Now, maybe maybe there's something that you know, maybe they just, they just had a couple a busy week, and then so they're they're kind of winding down, so they just want to be by themselves. Now, that's one thing. But you know, again, if if things don't seem to go back to normal, um, there there could be something beyond beyond that face. Um, you know, one of the things that's funny is that I talked to my therapist yesterday and we talked about certain things that, that are done. And for me, the, I think the, even, even on my bad days, I think the 
one of my strengths slash weaknesses is that I can put a smile on, even though I'm not, I'm not having a smiling day. Um, a smile's a mask at times for me, you know? And so knowing when someone might be forcing a laugh, forcing a smile, uh, forcing a happy moment, um, when it's not something that their character necessarily would just so they can, they can try to hide it. So. It's, it's interesting. I was, Finishing up a book there a couple of weeks ago on uh, hostage negotiations and basically how to break through in a conversation is to actually put, like you said there, I noticed that X, Y, and Z and trying to get that person to open up. And once you once they open up, you can make a connection to the person. Do you think as coaches, as a community, we need to change the way we listen? Do we need to improve how we listen? What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I, th I think one thing that, especially in the pro game, because we're around players so much, is that we've got to get to know the person. Um, I think sometimes we just look at people in our locker room as athletes. I think we need to get to know the person, get to know, to show that we care. Because I think once we, once we develop that relationship of, all right, you're a human being first, you're a person first, before you're an athlete, I think people are willing to, to kind of share a little bit more, right? We, we need to know about players, families. We need to know, maybe we don't know everything, but I think we need to know the, the culture in which they come from. Um, I think there's so much to learn about someone based on where, they, where they've been. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be in the pro game for this seven years now, and the, the stories that I hear, you know, the, of where people came from to come to the United States as refugees, as um, you know, coming over because their, their country was in a civil war or just growing up in different parts of the United States or, you know, being from Mexico and, and having this sort of support, this family support and, and things like that is, is critical to, to showing that you care beyond just a, beyond just the soccer player or the athlete. It's, it's so important to, to get to know the person. And because I think the moment that a person as a coach knows their player, the player gets to know their coach. Obviously there's those fine lines, right? That you don't want to cross, but, but I think there's, there's no, there shouldn't be a line to, to care about the human being. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's such a critical thing. And, and I, I look back at this, this last off season that I did have a, a, a player meeting. It was myself and, and the returning players. And I said, look, you guys know that I had a tough off season. I had a suicide attempt and the first thing that those players asked, they didn't ask like why the first player, the first thing that those guys asked was what can we do to help? How can we support you? Why? Because they cared about me as a, as a person and because I showed them that I cared that about them as a person throughout the season. And so I think, um, getting to know the players and, and showing that you care about them is, is such a critical, critical thing, especially in today's um, society where everything is so fast. Everything is so, we're so quick to, to pass judgment because of, I think the good and the bad of social media, right? We don't get to know the person on social media. We get to know kind of the things that they put out there, but we don't actually know the person. And so I think taking the time to know every player, every staff member that you work with, or even, you know, with us, like in the front office, I, I make it a point to try to get to know them as people so that the relationships can, can be organic, you know, and not just be forced on knowing this person as uh, all they do is all they do is this or all they're good at is this, you know, get to know them as a person to show that we care. It's interesting going back then to environments and obviously in, in the professional environment and even most college environments today, you've got so much technology that's tracking physical data. <laughs> And with you being more aware of, and the players being more aware of, like I would, I would imagine what that has created, what your talk to the players has created is more just awareness of each other. Is there, is there anything specific you do in your daily processes that helps with talking to the players? Do you sit down more or is it mostly informal stuff and learning more about them and just taking an interest? Yeah, a lot of it actually is, is more informal. Um, you know, getting to the training grounds and just making a point to to be in contact with different players uh, throughout the day, you know, as they come into the locker room, um, 
and things of that nature. Just, hey, how's everything going? You know, and, and even we got a couple guys that have kids on on our roster. And so, you know, how is so how is your little kid? How's your little boy, your little girl? How's the wife doing? How's the family doing? You know, getting to know when these guys how their how their parents coming into town for a match and, and say, Hey, how's your parents doing? Um, you know, and then that typically kinda kinda opens up the doors for, for other conversation, you know, and 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 again, just being very genuine about it, you know, to, in these informal meetings, because I think, again, sometimes with, with formal meetings, I think it creates kind of that environment of there could be a, an intimidating factor in there. Um, but informal meetings, I think, um, can create for, for honesty, you know, and uh, because even a player goes, oh, how's everything going with you? And then as a coach, you can show a little bit of vulnerability as a human, and then I think at that point, then true conversation comes up, you know, or not necessarily vulnerability, but you can also show the human side of it and be like, oh, it was great. You know, I had a great off day yesterday because I was able to go home and see my son play soccer, you know, and they'll, oh, that's awesome, you know, and, and things like that. And so, uh, again, it's it's allowing the, the players and athletes into your life without necessarily into your life, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you need that trust, right, because people – aren't going to so that's why you need the informal before you probably get to depth or anything you just need to be able to see the person associate them with friendliness or trust and things like that there yeah absolutely um, you know and then even even with these informals um, we have players that go hey like don't want to bring this up in the locker room but i'm having a little hard time uh, do you have any suggestions on where i can look for you know, whether it's therapy, whether it's, you know, some sort of help. And so, um, again, having those those opportunities to, to be honest, to, to be vulnerable at times um, creates for opportunity uh, for the players as well to be, okay, look, I'm a little vulnerable. And, and in fact, one of the things that I've, I've shared with, with players is, uh, you know, especially in today's um, masculinity or toxic masculinity, um, especially on the men's side in which in, in the environment in which I work in, is that, you know, it's it it takes more of a man to say, hey, I need help than to quote unquote man up. So so I think that's that's something too that especially with these young men, you know, the pros that we have it in their young twenties, mid twenties, I think it's it's so important to to move beyond the days of, of just manning up because they're they're struggling, you know, mentally or, or physically. You know, it's it's just not healthy for, for everyone to, to continue that, that type of talk. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then plus, so I'm, I'm really fascinated at, especially again, as I get more aware of this and, and start to educate myself a little bit more, I start questioning things I used to think were really healthy in environment, you know, competitiveness and having everyone moved out of their comfort zone. And I'm starting to think like, second guess a lot of things coming from a competitive working in a competitive environment do you, do you do the same where you're looking at things that might be now detrimental to young players and shifting focus maybe away from certain things and making it a little bit more comfortable for people no i i think you know i i think that still competing i think is is such a critical thing obviously we're in a professional environment where um if we lose a couple of games <laughs> we could, we could, our jobs are on the line, you know, and, and that's the reality of it. I think it's, and taking players out of their comfort zone, taking athletes, taking us as ourselves as coaches, you know, I think we still need to believe that good things happen beyond our comfort zone. You know, I think that's where we grow, where we expand. Uh, but on the same note, I, I think bringing up topics that are challenging, like mental health, that takes us out of our comfort zone. So good things can happen outside of our comfort zone. So I don't think we need to live in a bubble. In, in no way am I saying that a bubble is where we need to be because a bubble I think is what limits us as, as athletes, as coaches, as human beings. And so, you know, it, we need to break down the walls. We need to say, Hey, look, this is an important topic. This is real. Now, if a player comes in and says, Hey, look, I think I have a mental health challenge. Um, that could be challenging for a coach that could be uncomfortable. But then it's our job as coaches to know, okay, what are the resources? Again, we're not professionals in the mental health field, you know, just because we deal with it. But what are the resources? And I think as coaches, maybe that's the comfort zone that we need to get out of is, you know, if a player has a, has a foot injury, 
I'm going to know the orthopedic surgeon that's in town, right? I'm going to know, okay, I'm going to know the steps. Start with our, our head athletic trainer. Then they're going to refer you to maybe the team doc. And then that team doc is probably going to refer you to a specialist. Why can't we do the same as coaches with when it comes to mental health? Hey, coach, I'm having a problem. I, I, I don't know what it, what it is, but it's not – it's not a completely physical thing right now. And, and I'm not certain. Um, okay. Let's, let's take a look. All right. You know, let's have a game plan with our, with our athletic trainer. All right. Look, do we have steps in place for maybe if a player comes in and says, I think I'm suffering from a depression. Who do we call? Does our team doc have the resources? So I, I think trying to stay in our comfort zone is going to is good, is more detrimental to breaking the stigma, to um, breaking the current masculine, uh, the toxic masculinity culture that's in a locker room. So I think we do need to, one, keep the competitiveness because let, let's face it, in our, we're a results-driven society and in the professional game, if you're not providing results, you're out of a job, right? That's just the reality of it. We can't say, okay, we need to make the environment less competitive because we're not doing a service to ourselves as coaches, to the players that need this game to put, you know, food on the table to, to keep a roof over their head and their family's head. But we do need to continue to push beyond our comfort level because there are topics that society deems as inappropriate, such as mental health, that as coaches, we need to have the steps in place to know that if an athlete comes to me, if another staff member comes to me and says, I need help that we can provide them that, that assistance and that guidance. Again, not give them the professional help because that's not what our background and our, and our, and our education is in, but we do need to educate ourselves to go, okay, where do we start? Who can I recommend this athlete to, or this staff member to, um, to better themselves? So when we go beyond our comfort zone, we need to be go beyond it, not just on the field, but also to develop game plans for off the field so that we can better uh, the human beings that we work with every single day. Coaching itself can bring some mental health challenges, pressure, criticism, all the setbacks in the game, expectations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it, it then can also act as maybe a distraction in the game, you know, putting that energy into soccer and taking you away from sometimes the real world. Which has it been more for you? Um, so I'm, I'm at best when, when my brain is, is engaged, um, when – I have task. I'm very task oriented. And so um, one of the things that my therapist and my psychiatrist, we kind of came to the conclusion is that um, why it hit me so hard in the off season is that I didn't necessarily find a purpose. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously a purpose of trying to build for it, but it wasn't that same daily um, task that was needed to be done. And for me, the, the game is something that allows me to, to have a focal point. And so, from that standpoint, um, the coaching profession and, and the daily um, task are what ac actually allow me to be at my best. And it allows me to to not ignore my, I wouldn't say it's a distraction um, because I live with bipolar disorder every day, so there's no distraction. You know, I, I wake up, I take my meds, I, I write in my journal. Um, but as far as like just being engaged, coaching is probably one of the the best things because um, as you know coaching isn't one of those nine to fives and, and again not putting down anyone with a nine to five but there is no there's there's no clocking out right like um, sometimes I, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and think of like oh what if we tried this on a free kick you know and I and I grab my notepad next to my bed and, and I'm drawing it up so then I don't forget it in the morning you know and and so I think that's the greatest thing with coaching is that you look at something or you watch another sport and you go, oh, I wonder how we can translate that into soccer, you know, and, and I watch a lot of basketball. And, and so when I'm not when I'm not working on on, on soccer specific stuff, a lot of the staff and, and the players know that there's probably a basketball game on and it doesn't matter what what level I'm, I'm probably watching basketball because um, I try to emulate certain things on, on set pieces. OK, how, how they run this pick or whatever. And so for me, coaching is, is fantastic. And, and on the same note, you know, I think some people um struggle with with the coaching side because it isn't you know you can't block out it's always going right you're there's always something that you're you're excited about or concerned about you know we as coaches we keep our phone on all the time because we're 
we're a point of contact for every athlete that we deal with. And so something can happen, right? Good, bad, or indifferent, something can happen. And so we got to make ourselves available and, and we're not always just, all right, we're shutting it down uh, after a game and see you guys on Monday, but that's not how it works. Obviously we're, but for me, I think I was at, at one point, especially early in my coaching career, I, I felt some of the pressures um, of coaching. But then as, as I got into my adulthood, I've come to realize that coaching is something I do. Soccer is something I do or a part of. It's not who I am. And so um, it doesn't d- define me as, as a person. Like it, it, it really is just something that we do, right? The game will always be there. And so if we get to that point where maybe it is a lot of pressure, maybe we can't handle the expectations, the game will be there tomorrow, right? And so I think we need to address that individually to go, okay, is this healthy for me? If it's not, how can I turn it into a healthy environment for myself as a coach? Because ultimately, it's a trickle-down effect, right? It, it'll affect our players. And um, I think worst off, it, it affects us as, as people, and it'll affect us with our, with our personal lives, with our families, you know, the way that we deal with our kids, deal with our wife, deal with, um, you know, people that we really care about. And so, again, I think reminding ourselves that is that coaching is something that we do, and it's not who we are. Um, can change, I think, the outlook of things. I, I had a, a head coach um, at the pro level that I was fortunate to work with, and I remember one of the one of the uh, interviews that he did with a in the media, and they said, "Do you have the pressure of you know you're going into the championship in your first year? Um, do you have the pressure?" And he said, "What pressure? There's pressure of the people that work in the emergency room trying to save someone's life. Pressure is the fireman that has to go back into the house that's burning down to, to save a child." That's pressure. What we do in sports isn't pressure. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of a lot of demand of getting results, but people's lives aren't necessarily on the line. Yeah, you know, maybe we, we do need that check to to make sure that we continue to get that check to to put food on the table. But we're we're not in the same um, environment as an emergency room doctor. You know that that does that where there is pressure to keep someone's life alive, you know? And and I think when you start to look at it and start to look at the game as, Hey, it's a game, it's a vehicle to be able to work with people to, um, to influence uh, human beings. I think it, it starts to take away some of that, you know, quote unquote pressure that, that we put on ourselves. Yeah. I've said that when I was talking to Dan Abrams, I was, I said, I thought I was under pressure when I was at, college coach and I really nobody nobody cared but uh, I think you mentioned social media before one thing social media has done is it's probably uh, shaped our our self-image a lot a lot uh, more aligned to results and more aligned to perception than it ever has been before so now a rec coach is probably under pressure from maybe their social media account than they've than they ever have been before how has the response been from coaches since you shared your story? Have people come out and said, listen, I'm going through the same thing. How has it been in the community? Oh, it's absolutely been amazing. Um, there are some coaches that have sent me direct messages or have um, guided some of their athletes to contact me um, in the United Soccer League um, and even in the college game. You know, and, and it's not so much to, again, provide expertise, but – it's in the first steps of people going, oh, there's someone like me out there. There's someone that has the same challenges. And a lot of times I think it's easier to talk to a stranger, right, about your challenges than it is to talk to your own family or your best friend. And so, and as, as bad as social media can be, I think we can use it for good because it can connect complete strangers that feel like they're alone. Um, you know, it's, it's been amazing, the support. And some people that you're like, oh, this person is so, uh, so tough, you know, they're, they, they've played at this level or um, they've worked with these types of players or they played alongside, you know, some of these great players that, that we watch on TV or that we go to stadiums to, and we pay to go see. Um, they've opened up their, their vulnerable side. And, and which I think is amazing because people go, man, I've always thought so that people are in the same boat. I was for like 13 years where they're like, I thought I was in this by myself, but I'm not. And so having those, those communications or lines of communication to where I can chat even with other coaches and go, Hey man, you know, how's, how's everything going? You know, just a, just a casual check-in and those informal um, 
meetings or informal interactions to where you can, I can now send a text to someone that I only knew as a coach, but now I get to know them as a human being. And I can say, I can send them a, co- a text and say, Hey, hope everything's good. You know, and the same thing, they're like, Hey, how's everything going? You know, I haven't talked in a while. Um, and it's not even so much about like, how the results are for the team because obviously a lot of that is, is online, but it's, Hey, how's the family doing? How are the kids doing? How, you know, how's the wife doing? Um, and so I think we're through this journey. Um, I'm able to break down the walls too of like, of getting to know people as well. And so I think that's, that's a huge thing is that, um, and even, even these young, young players, these young pros that, that have been directed towards me that feel like, they're the only ones in their locker room that are dealing with it. Um, they're now going, oh, you know what? At least I have someone I can just talk to and not necessarily get advice or be judged about. Um, I can just talk to them. And I remember talking to one of these young pros um, about a month ago, and he goes, this has been the best thing I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to do, just talk. And I maybe said 10 words in a 30-minute conversation. And – you know, I just remember that saying, telling to the kid, you're not alone in this, you know, and, and, and that's, that's kind of all I really had to say, but the kid just wanted to talk, you know, and I say kid, he's, he's I think 22 or so, but it, it's, it's letting these guys know that, Hey, you're not alone. And I guarantee you, there's probably someone else in your locker room that, that is also quietly fighting that fight. And, and so, um, for me, it's, it's been fantastic because I've been able to get to know other human beings through this, through social media. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I, I always look, you know, even in preparing for this podcast with, you know, why, why I'm, I'd, I'd like to blame the fact that it's the coaching, you know, this, this culture that we're talking about, but then also coming from having an Irish background and talking about growing up in Northern Ireland, my wife would, would gladly tell you that I, uh, without even knowing it, probably push things to humor to deal with things that I'm uncomfortable with. And then with players that you're, you know, that, that sit down with you and do discuss their problems, sometimes as uh, my biggest fault is that I sit and then try to solve it within three minutes. And what you're saying there is that you don't even have to do that. You can just listen and just let them know that you're there to support them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I think that's, that's a key word too, is that um, I think people don't necessarily want advice, right? They don't necessarily want help in a traditional way. I think they just want support. They just want to know that someone's there to listen and not pass judgment and not tell them what to do. Um, you know, I think, again, I think we're so quick to say, okay, Nah, this is why that person's struggling. They need to, you know, they just need to smile. They'll be, they'll, yeah. they'll be happier, right? And, and I think just going, hey, look, hey, I'm here. What you need, if you just need a, an ear, an honest ear, I'm here to listen. If you want to just talk and, you know, talk about soccer, talk about basketball, or whatever, whatever other you know things they're into, hey, we'll talk about that. We don't even have to talk about um, some of the other stuff that that you know we won't talk about stuff you don't want to talk about. But know that I'm here to listen. And I'm here to, to talk whatever you want to talk about. And it's not, and if you don't want any advice, I'm not going to give you advice. Um, you know, so that type of, I, I think, honesty and, and understanding, I think, goes a long way. Okay, last one for you. I had a coach reach out and message me. Whenever I, was, whenever I tweeted about your, um, the, the project with Brand New Day, she sent me a message and asked me about dealing with, within your team so understanding that you have someone who's struggling with mental health and you having to manage them you know if it's not out in the locker room and and obviously at youth levels and college levels probably people don't really really don't want other people to know about it and they're not confident in putting that out there with their friends or their social circles i like she wanted to know how she should deal with it as a coach because do you run the risk as a coach with managing them in a different way and then saying, oh, well, you're, you know, she gets away with that or I, he gets away with this here and there's double standards. How do you maneuver around that there as a team? How open should you be in the whole team about someone's problems? What's your advice on that? Well, I, I think, you know, and I haven't worked in the youth game in, in quite some time, but 
if if I was put in that situation, I would definitely sit down with the parents because obviously if 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 it's if you know about it, then somewhere along the line, you know, if it's a youth player, maybe the parents are the ones that that initiated the conversation or said, hey, look, our our child is you know lives with depression, is clinically diagnosed with anxiety or whatever it is. I think the biggest step is um, is to ask, okay, what what can I do to support this? What, how can I, how can I, as, as a coach help, help out, you know, what, what can I do in, in our environment to make sure that, um, that your child, um, isn't triggered or isn't, doesn't look at this as a, as an awkward environment or, or a environment that they don't want to be part of. Because I think the, and again, coming from my own experiences, I think the, for me, the worst thing that could happen is that, um, I'm treated differently. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like being stamped with, with something of, oh, this kid gets away with it because, or this person gets away with it um, because of this, you know, it's, and it's not, it should never be an excuse. Um, it should just be, hey, look, we live with something, you know, and that's, that's the challenge we have. And so uh, I, I think getting to talk to the parents and, and maybe even saying, okay, look, at your next therapy appointment, explain how your child plays on a soccer team. What are some accommodations or what are ways to, to make sure that our child has a positive experience with our coach? Our coach cares enough to want to know. They just don't have the education or the experience to, to deal with it. And so our coach would like to know how can they, how can they be supportive in this journey? So I, I, that's what I would start with. And obviously, as they get older, um, you know, I think if you're coaching, let's say, at a high school or even a college, um, hopefully there's a department, you know, whether it's a, a school counselor or um, maybe a, um, a psychology department or, or things like that, where I think as coaches, I think, we again, it goes back to that being out of our comfort zone of knowing the resources that are around us to say, okay, look, um, there's a player that opened up, you know, and obviously if the player's says, hey, in confidentiality, I, I just want you to know that I deal with depression. You know, you know, obviously don't don't tell the the people you, you're you're seeking um, assistance with, but making sure that um, unless unless the you know like the school counselor or psychiatrist knows, but um, but I would just say, look, I just want to make sure that our environment continues to be more inclusive rather than exclusive. What are the steps I can do to to make sure that um, that my environment in, in, as a team and, you know, myself as a coach um, is more welcoming to people rather than excluding them, primarily people that deal with, with mental health challenges. And then what's the advice for a coach who, maybe it's a young coach, maybe it's a coach who hasn't been aware, maybe it's someone like myself who's just looking to educate them a little bit more. Is there, is there reading, is there resources, is there someone that should be going, is there things they should be looking for? Yeah, I, I would just, you know, there's, there's more and more, like, I think, I believe the NCAA is starting to create resources for dealing with college athletes. Um, the NBA has taken an initiative that every team now must have a, a, a professional in the mental health field. Um, you know, that movement was started by Kevin Love. Um, so I, I think one of the biggest things now is to, with, with the access of the Internet and and so many uh, things online, um, there's there's a ton of, scholarly articles again i think making sure that they're scholarly articles so they're they're legitimate um just starting to read and and research um you know what things to do with dealing with athletes with with mental health challenges um and then even you know if if you have the resources let's say on on a college campus a high school campus um just to find out like hey look i'd like to schedule an appointment with our school counselor um uh, not for myself as far as like directly with, with mental health challenges, but as a coach, I'd like to know what do you recommend, you know, and, and using, using those, the, your, your time is, you know, to me, it's coaching development as well. It's, it's coaching education is we always talk about X's and O's, but these are things that are real life um, concerns or real life um, things that we have to deal with. And so spending time to, to research what are the, things I can do to to create for a, a more positive environment, especially with an athlete that deals with uh, mental health challenges, I think is uh, 
I think is as coaches, we need to do better at and just kind of generalize, you know, start in general and, and going, okay, mental health in sports and then fine tuning it down to, you know, specifically with what, with the athletes with depression or um, athletes with anxiety or bipolar disorder, um, you know, and, and the, the range goes on and on because not everyone's going to have um, a situation where they're, they're contemplating or acting upon suicidal thoughts. Um, some of it could just be like, they, they have a very tough time dealing with losses because it's, it's beyond more than just the loss in the game, you know? And so, um, again, doing some research, um, online and even, even accessing resources in your current environment, um, at the school level to, to see, um, you know, what the, what do the professionals around you recommend, uh, dealing, as far as dealing with, you know, to make your environment more welcoming. Chris, thank you so much, not just for coming on and, and sharing your story, but also for providing a fair bit of education in this uh, in this chat. This has been fantastic, and it's something that I would like to do a little bit more of in terms of not just raising awareness and not just tweeting something out once a year on Mental Health Day, but, but to try and help the community of coaches and the community of players. So we'd love to have you on again, or if there's things that we can help with as a community to make us a little bit better. Absolutely. I would love to, you know, to continue this. And, and that was one of the biggest th challenges I'd put out was that let's talk about mental health beyond the month of May, Mental Health Awareness Month. You know, now it's September. It's uh, Suicide uh, Prevention and Awareness Month. And so I, I think these are great months to educate ourselves to because there's there's so many of these the organizations that are there for mental health that are now using their social media platforms to put out facts and statistics and resources that I think it's 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 such an important topic, uh, not just as coaches, but as human beings. It's if we continue to to say, oh, I don't have to deal with that. It's not my problem. Then we're taking steps backwards. And I think as 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 a society, we need to take steps forward. We need to break the stigma. And you being willing to allow me to come onto the podcast and use your platform to talk about it, talk about my my story, and talk about uh, some of the things that I've dealt with. Um, you and yourself is, are, are becoming an advocate. And I think that's, we look at it, we need to look at it as one by one, we're advocates for mental health and suicide prevention. So really, really appreciate you taking this time to, to allow me onto your platform. Thanks so much to Christopher for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, I said at the start that it was a powerful and inspiring perspective and it probably doesn't do it justice because the story is it's still going on every day and to go beyond yourself and to take it to another level to help other people and to bring it to your club and to help other colleagues it, it is really really powerful stuff so I can't thank Christopher enough I said that it was it was something that I wanted to do a little bit more of and I don't do near enough hopefully there are opportunities to do that as a coaching community from my perspective i think a couple of things eh? we had jordan and jelly on here talking about injuries a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about the education of coaches and coach education having to move a little bit more of dealing with with people with those types of injury issues long term coming back return to play all that good stuff and i think the same applies to mental health and i think that if sports science or technology or whatever it was 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 the big thing 10 years ago that was coming into everyone's world and, and impacting our environments. I think today, understanding people, understanding what people are going through, I think now coaches, it's not just sports psychology, it's just understanding people, being a bit more empathetic, being a bit more aware of the things that are going on in people's world. And, and I probably didn't frame it right when I was talking to Christopher about the competitive environment and going back to that there where I feel and I've second guessed a lot of things is is the mentality that I would have had five ten years ago show up with the right attitude the attitude is everything you've got to bring the attitude you've got to bring the energy and I've gone completely off that there just based off experience and just based off yeah being a bit more educated in the past five years that that not everyone can bring energy and attitude every day and if you do want them to bring that there then maybe you're putting them in a position where they're not being themselves and maybe that can be detrimental to their health. So 
there was a tweet that went out last week. Dan Abrams jumped on it. It was at the Southampton Academy. It was ten list of ten things that you're in control of, and Dan questioned them. And I was, you know, I was nodding my head, and that's where that's where I think we should be a little bit more aware of a, as a coaching community with our teams is that sometimes we put too much on the player to bring a type of mentality when our environment and our behaviour, our style of coaching can actually impact it a lot more. Than, than they can. We just have to accept a little bit more ownership perhaps and a little bit more responsibility. When it comes to then to working alongside our colleagues, I think we can definitely get a lot better. Like I think we can look after each other a little bit more, not necessarily pick up the phone and call 100 people a week. But even when I was driving here, uh, I had one of uh, a good friend of mine is a college coach and called me and was telling me about basically showing up at a pitch and having, we were going through a dialogue of, how other coaches on game day really put on a little bit of a different persona and everyone is trying to get an advantage an hour and a half before kickoff when you're putting the lineups off or up or where you're exchanging information or where you're showing someone to the locker room and there are people that look for marginal gains in those areas of well you can you know send them for a little walk or keep them out in the sun for an extra 10 minutes and we were saying that there's just no need for it Coaching is a, is a hard, hard job. I have empathy for every single coach at every single level. It's, it's very, very difficult, especially today. You know, maybe we should address the fact that we shouldn't be adding a little bit more on to our colleagues and maybe being a bit more genuine whenever we, we approach different coaches on game day. And, and it's just how we approach that. I think we could be a little bit better as a community. And I think that's, again, education. Because social media is moving us in a different direction, it's moving our teams in a different direction, it's moving society in a different direction, it's naturally going to move coaching in a different direction. Majority of it will be positive, but there will be negatives in that there that we're going to have to work through. And I think that's where, like Christopher said, there's good and bad. The good is surely that there's more information now, that there is more awareness. So hopefully we can build on that. I would love to hear your thoughts. Email gary at modernsoccercoach.com at Gary Cornean. If there's something we missed, if there's another area that there that we want to touch on and, and, and go with, please let me know. We definitely would definitely love to pick that up. And like I said, use this platform to help it a little bit more. So appreciate your thoughts, appreciate your listening, appreciate the support, and have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.